I'm Travis, so I'm also known as TI-283. Uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly a little backstory on that, because many of you might be confused why it says Kevin if I'm Travis. Uh, the reason is my best friend Brad, it's a cousin named Kevin, we always played Pokemon together growing up, and we borrowed his cousin Kevin's cartridge to play Pokemon Emerald, so I would always be Kevin when I was playing Pokemon, so I'm now TI Kevin, and I also do code golf challenges in TI 83 Basin. So it's TI Kevin 83. So that's a little, that's a little backstory on the name there. So, but we're going to do an overview tonight of all of the web technology that I use in my hobby speedrunning projects. So we're going to do a little live demo soon here of what I actually show off at conferences. They talk about like getting stuff quick, and uh, I was talking with one of the other attendees about LTX we were at last August. And uh, we're going to be at the Midwest Gaming Classic in just uh, a few weeks here, too. So uh, we do a lot of conferences like that showing speed and technology. And today we're going to talk about some of the web technology that's come out of everything we found doing these speed runs. So, okay, we're going to do that. What is Pokemon first? Some of you might know what Pokemon is, so we're going to make sure to get to that, too. Then who the heck am I? We, we already know. We don't need to do that. What is speed running? We might need to do that, so we're going to do that. And then we're going to show the verification, and then we're going to talk about what. Okay. So what is Pokemon? Pokemon Yellow is one of the games I play, but Pokemon in general is the largest grossing media franchise, period. It has total 80 billion, mostly off of merchandise sales. And for comparison, Mickey Mouse in second has total 52 billion in total sales. So very, very massive franchise. Pokemon games are RPGs that involved catching, trading, and dueling a fictional universe of wild animals known as Pokemon. And there is a popular, long-running anime tie-in TV show uh, and many spin-off movies associated with Pokemon. So Pokemon Yellow, one of the games that I specialize in doing speed runs of, and we're gonna, we're gonna spend a speed running this too, so don't worry, we gotta get that too, but uh, I specialize in it. Uh, it it's a tie-in game that they created to make the first generation of the video game a little bit more like the anime that they were producing at the time. So uh, that's that's Pokemon. And each of the nine generations of Pokemon now are based in a different region of Japan. So like the Kyushu province or Honshu, different islands on Japan have maps to different uh, generations of Pokemon. And they've also recently got Spain and the UK and some other areas of the world. So uh, me, I'm ti 83 uh, one of my friends made this lovely little bitmoji of me. And uh, I, I'm a speedrun record holder, actually, in Pokemon Yellow. I have a record in the tool assisted speedrun of both glitchless and no state corruption. And there's another category called safe corruption, which is even faster than those two, which I do not have a record in, because it's much more complicated. Uh, I'm an official ambassador for TAS videos as well. So TAS videos is a site that hosts records of speedruns. And uh, I've talked about the contents of that. And I'm also an administrator with TaskBot. TaskBot is a team that takes stuff that's archived on taskviews.org and shows it at those live conferences with the additional condition of it being on live original gaming hardware and not in emulators. So we'll get to that. So we talked a lot about speedrunning already. What is speedrunning? Uh, speedrunning is playing video games often, but not necessarily retro games with a timer running to track completion time. And speedrunners add these arbitrary goals to games to enable to timing different potential categories of different lengths, i.e. Like you might just be beating the game, or you might be getting every collectible and getting 100% complete of a game. So we'll have all these different categories, all the different arbitrary rules for speedrunners to be able to make these like uh, special timed categories. And then sometimes, when we do speedruns, we need tools to help runners evaluate the quality of the run. So they want to know in real time, hey, if I keep doing this run, am I likely to get a, a world record or a new P personal best uh, PP time? So we built tools in websites to help make speedrunners go faster or make sure that they're going faster than they have before. And then the next thing we need to, need to get into is not what is speedrunning, but what is casting. So if speedrunning is playing a video game fast, Tasking is playing through a game perfectly. And it does that by taking a game and slowing it down to go frame by frame. 
And we do that by instead of playing the game live on the hardware, we build an emulator that is perfectly accurate to the original system, to where stepping through it frame by frame shows the same frames that you would see if you played the game live in real time. And that allows you then in the emulator to pause, go back and change and fix your mistakes to build a perfect run. Often it's not actually perfect because if you do the math, um, like eight inputs on a controller, even on the NES, to the power of however many frames you have, that's more than the number of ads in the universe. It's not actually perfect, but it's, it, we, we get very close. And there's been some shorter ones, like Dragster, that have had mathematical proofs done of the actual fastest time that just prove cheaters and such. So that's a top one, top two. But for the purpose here, just uh, tasking is uh, taking those speed runs and slowing them down frame perfectly and making perfect uh, records. And then task video is sort of a representative, uh, is a site that aggregates and tracks those records so that we can have a kind of collective understanding of yes, this is the current record of this game and the community all agrees on that specific time. And uh, you can kind of see here uh, a player piano. This is an analogy I love to use to explain what tasking is. A player piano is a piano where there's like a roll of the keys that, it, that goes through, and the piano will play itself by seeing what holes are in the paper. And it's like basically exactly the same thing with tasking. There's a roll of inputs, and it's going to be zero, zero, and then oh, maybe the stick needs to be 100 degrees for this frame, 120 degrees the next frame. So you can kind of see how it's now. Okay, so we've talked about speed running and we've talked about tasking, but now there's a whole new layer, task verification. This is what TaskBot does, we show at conferences. So going from task to task verification, we're designing controller interfaces to inject inputs into the original console. So once we've built the task, the script of that piano roll of all those perfect inputs, it can then convert it into a format that the console would actually recognize and play it back on the original hardware instead of an internet. And TaskBot is a notorious as a mascot for that process. We do that all the time. Games done for the events. And I think we've raised over like $1.3 million for charity now for between Red Cancer Foundation and Doctors Without Borders. So it's a great charity to do. Um, but the, another really cool thing also with task verification is that those scripts then, when they're verified, can act as test ROMs for emulators, because emulators need to know whether or not they're accurate, and if you can then take that thing that you've proved is exactly the way the console worked, and then play it back in the emulator, you get an additional layer of, a, kind of like a unit test for your emulator that can play back the input script the same way the console works. So, all that being said, we're gonna do it live. We're gonna show you the task verification live. So, Right now, we are in Pokemon Coliseum. Pokemon Coliseum has a buffer overflow exploit in its save data. So I have a, it's like a very special crafted save on the memory card in the part of the GameCube that I've injected from a Wii. So I have a Wii that's hacked in my house, and we inject the save data from the Wii. It's, it's way easier to hack Wii than it is to hack the GameCube, because it has internet access, and you can just go to the website and go here. Uh, so we have then the GameCube with the hack save files. Now we're going to play through Coliseum up until it loads our first Pokemon in our party's name. And that name is longer than the game developers intended to be possible for being displayed. They assumed that you could only input so many characters, but they stored the actual name as much longer than the bug that they uh, made available for you inputting characters. So there's this bug, if you go over here into a specific fight, and get that name to show up, that the game will crash. But it will very conveniently for us crash in such a way that gives us total control of the game. <laughs> and by total control, I just mean we can play any program we want from there. We could inject any program you could ever write. <laughs> cool trainer book. So once we're in there, the second memory card slot is going to come into play. Go ninja! <laughs> and now we have total control of the game. <laughs> so, this is Swiss. This is a homebrew data manager for the game that lets you play 
whatever you want. One of the really cool things you can do with it actually is you can put an SD card of every GameCube game that was ever made on the front of this GameCube in one of the memory card ports. And it will emulate the disc reader and you can play literally any game without having to reset your GameCube or anything. It's just straight there in the front of your GameCube. No disc reader. And this is all also with completely original, nothing we've done is non-original hardware. We're all still in completely original Nintendo hardware. Even the SD card reader was a Nintendo accessory designed for use with uh, Animal Crossing games. So we're, we're completely using Nintendo's system to have design. Now, now that we're in total control of the GameCube, the GameCube has an accessory at the bottom of it called the Game Boy Player. This is not just a normal GameCube, it's a GameCube that has the Game Boy Player attachment. And the Game Boy Player attachment itself contains an entire Game Boy Advance. And the Game Boy Advance, for backwards compatibility reasons, contains an entire Game Boy Color, which backwards compatibly supports the Game Boy, which we can perfectly emulate. It's a lot harder to emulate newer stuff than the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. We're working on our Game Boy Advance a little bit, but the Game Boy and Game Boy Color we can do. So the practical upshot of all that is I can play a replacement software we built for the Game Boy Player startup disk because the game needs to know how to talk to the Game Boy Player. The replacement Game Boy Player software will allow us to read inputs from the SD card to then play the inputs from like the, the piano roll. The, the, this guy here has the piano roll for the text. Okay. You want, you want to do it? You want to see it? Yeah. Okay. We're going to do Kirby's Dream Land. Pull out the controller. Nothing is touching the, the game. You can see in the upper left the input viewer, and that's the input screen from the input log right now live. And you can see too, Kirby will often vacuum in enemies. Uh, the GameCube can only show so many sprites at a time. And even if it's showing all the sprites it can, even that's too slow. So the passer is sucking in enemies to make the game engine run faster because so many sprites can overload the game engine. You don't see a lot of damage boosts and stuff where it's, it's getting damaged by bosses and then uh, smash forward in the game. So we'll, we'll just enjoy this here for a few minutes and then we'll switch over. And if I showed the whole thing, it would take 20, we don't need to do it the whole thing. I just wanted to show you guys this is possible. Does anybody have any questions or observations or anything while we're watching here? Go for it, Matt. How did y'all figure that out? There's a guy named Fix94. He found the series of exploits. It's, I think it's an issue actually in like a standard SDK that they to make for games. So if they there's a whole bunch of games that have a very similar named exploit that you can inject. Um, uh, Melee has a similar exploit. Um, Twilight Princess. Double uh, Summon Agent Under Fire has the fastest one. So, and, that, and that's great because, or maybe not the fastest one, or the fastest one. That's great because it's cheap. You can buy, buy the big Agent Under Fire for 20 bucks. So, in the speedrunning community, why not just use a hack? run natively on some kind of hardware and it's just hard to demonstrate and validate with a regular piece. With an actual Game Boy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like way more complicated. You need to open it up, solder onto the input lines, and then build a microcontroller that can send things. And then you also, one of the crucial things that makes this all work is that the Game Boy player sends up audio data and video data over a, a bus to the GameCube. And we need to know internally how fast the Game Boy is running. So nominally that would be about four megahertz, or four megahertz, I think it is, it's like two to the sun. So uh, nominally it runs at a certain rate, but every single manufactured piece of silicon oscillates at a different rate. And they don't, they don't run at exactly the manufacturer rates. You can see that uh, even now with their modern chips, they don't, they don't run at exactly five megahertz, they're gonna run at 5.01, 4.99, a lot all over the place. So, what we do to be able to know exactly what we're supposed to send the input is we watch how much audio data we've gotten from the Game Boy player and then use that amount of data to know where to send our input. Yeah. So, I'll ask a question. 
Yeah, Travis, are we, are we watching a speed run right now? Yes, this is the fastest possible run of Kirby's Dream. Wow. And it's all being done on the original hardware. And then just to remember, the, the Game Boy Player attachment is a Game Boy Advance. It's not like an emulator of a Game Boy Advance. It's an actual, has the same hardware as a Game Boy Advance does. It just has some changes that the video and audio get sent over to the Game Boy Advance instead of to the actual LCD. I was playing League of Legends back around like 2016, 2017. I love the laugh. It's great. It's great. It, uh, the, the community is not amazing for League of Legends. But I, was, I wanted to stream stuff. And one of the things I found in the Watch Around streams was you know, streaming of playing Pokemon Yellow. I had played Pokemon Yellow when I was up. I, I still use my, my original cart for it in these demos. We wanted to watch a Pokemon cast. And uh, yeah, so I, I got into it that way. And then I got from playing it by hand, I got like third or fourth of the leaderboards playing it by hand. And my hand started hurting. And I was like, I don't want to get arthritis. So I switched over to tasking, which was no less sort of right as <laughs> Yeah. And now I do this uh, more, more, I'm more focused on doing these talks or making websites than doing the actual passing of these things. Yeah. All right, so that's tools to speed art. Okay, so now that we know what that is, we're gonna watch some tools that we use for helping speedrunners do things and also preserving the video that we get out of speedruns for task videos that work. So, static microsites using TypeScript and or React are super easy to spin up, get web pages, get lab pages, and things like that. And we can use them to re-implement many tools that were previously written in Java 7, Java 8, for other parts of the web. So, well, it was also closed source and not as accessible back in the day. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Gen 1 catch rate calculator. There's a problem in the random number generator for Gen 1 Pokemon games. And that is something called rejection sampling and deterministic seeding. So uh, if we follow along with how this works, okay, we, where I talked about we're watching an amount of time the console has been on to know when the setting is. And if you follow that to its logical conclusion, it means there, there's got to be randomness in there, right? Well, the randomness will always act the same way from the same amount of time the console has been on. So, in a practical sense, there's no actual randomness in anything. In a, in a computer, it's pseudo random. The random number generator in Pokemon Gen 1 uses that clock of how long the console has been on to seed its random number generator in advance. It's actually, it doesn't use like a percent or any of an actual like algorithmically sound thing. It just takes how long has the console been on, and then it, the next frame it says, oh, how long has it been on, add that to the previous value. A new number. And it looks kind of random, but if you have played Pokemon Gen 1 and walk in circles with the grass, it's not random. You get the same encounters over and over again, and it really doesn't work as well as you thought. So if you dive into it, you can see that the problem is that this, this should look like one color that's like a mosaic. Like all the colors are like interspersed. Like if you get like a zero in the random number generator in one spot, and the second time you call it, those two things are not correlated. Like, in a random number generator, you don't want the previous value to influence the next value you get where it's not random. So if you see like one axis, it's one call, and the other axis is the other call. If, if you're seeing patterns in here, it means those two things are tied too closely. So what we figured out is that the problem is that there's a rejection sample. So when you choose to use a Pokeball or a Great Ball or an Ultra Ball, First generation Pokemon. Those, those balls will give you a better chance of catching the wild encounter. Uh, the Great Ball and the Ultra Ball first restrict your random number to be like 0 to 150 or 0 to 200. And if it's restricted to be a certain number, it can't be the other numbers. And then if you say, like, okay, let's say 201 from a Pokeball always maps to getting a 2 for the second call because of how the random number generator works then that two would mean you would catch it. Well, you can't get that. You can't get that number because it's projected away 201. And then let's say 202 maps to seven, and then seven would mean you don't catch it. Well, that's also been rejected. So the practical upshot of all of this is that the rejection sampling means that uh, for a lot of Pokemon, 
it's way harder to catch them than you would intend because it's rejected away numbers that would lead to you catching the Pokemon if it worked out. Please ask questions because I'm probably going to speak a bunch of very technical garbage about how random number generators work. Yeah, so like, imagine you, you're like called random in like a, at your job store line, okay? And you get like 10 as your number. Or there's, there's no 0 to 1. There's going to be a 0 0.5. Okay. So imagine like you get 0 0.5 here. And then you call it again. So this is like your second time you're calling it here, and you get like 0. 0.7. So what you should see if, if this is truly like pseudo random is all the colors like intermixed and no like obvious pattern, just like the look at noise. But instead you see like, oh, this whole middle part here, if you get a 0. 0.5 on uh, the first roll, then the second roll, it's not gonna get you a catch. So yeah, yeah. So we built a tool in the web browser that runs through the actual like Game Boy assembly code or a translation of it to JavaScript for every possible random number and like undiscombobulates those correlations. And we do that with web workers. So we actually just found 16 different web workers, one for each thread or HP value. And then it goes into the threads and looks at all the different other possibilities of random numbers that could be influencing the catch. And for all of that, it spits out numbers of what's possible. So this is kind of, this is a common pattern you'd see for web workers where I say, hey, go do a bunch of math out on this promise, and then post the message, and, and then we'll get it back. So uh, web workers are super useful for threading things in the web if you ever need to do an actually truly multi-threaded work. Because if you, if you just do a promise, that's not actually getting you off the main thread in JavaScript. You're still on a single thread in promises. You need workers to get into actually having multiple threads. And then we can resolve all the promises with promise, promise dot. And then this is what some of the actual math of the RNG calculations actually looks like. Where we're, we're looping every possible RNG byte 0 to 255 and a byte is 256 numbers. And then we're looping through every possible internal state of the divider, which is that timer of how long the console is over in the taxing land. And then once we've looped through those things, that can generate every possible state of the RNG and see whether or not it would lead to a catch. So in the website, you get two values. This is the value that like Bulbapedia would spit out for what your probability of catching the Pokemon would be. And this is the value that the site actually calculates based on how the random number generator actually works. And all of this came about, and this research came about because a guy named Ixarian was doing a run called Ash Person, where it's basically like cosplaying as Ash in the first season of the anime, and going through and being like, okay, so I need to catch a Butterfree, and I need to release it, or I need to release a Pidgeotto. I, I don't quite even remember off the top of my head, but you're doing all the steps that Ash would have in the anime. One of those steps is catching 29 Tauros, and he was doing the math on his attempts of like, wait, I've been catching like, only 6% of the Tauros I've encountered, and it should be 10% if I put my number in Volpedia. Why is that? So then we, we built this to show, oh yeah, it's because the random number generator doesn't work. <laughs> One of the other cool things in that space that we worked on was assembly script. So uh, you guys probably know what TypeScript is web developers, but there's something called assembly script, and that lets you directly write WebAssembly code, like our byte code, in a, a TypeScript like language. So you can like annotate your thing as a uint8 or a uint16 and not just a number, and then it will translate it directly into WebAssembly instead of into TypeScript. And that allows even more optimization than just the thread. It turned out that we were able to do other optimizations and not need that crazy level of optimization to get the site to work fast enough. But that's another cool thing. If you need like crazy high performance web code, you can write assembly script. Cool, so that wraps up the, uh, the catch rate calculator. There's another cool thing in Pokemon that I wanted to talk about a little web tool we built called the Gen 1 class of DV calculator. So in Pokemon, DVs in the first generation are like machines. They kind of determine how good or how bad a Pokemon is. And the, the DVs are 0 to 15, and they map to the later generation's IVs, which are now 0 to 31. And the way they did that, I wish I could. Yes, okay, sweet. 
So the way they did that is they called the RMG twice, and they took the first half of it to be the attack, and the second half to be the defense. And then the second time they called it, they took the first half to be speed, and the second half to be special. Those are different like stats that are relevant to a Pokemon. And then they took the last bit of every number they called, and they created another nibble of four bits for the HP. So that's how the, the data is actually stored internally. But we need to know those numbers almost as soon as possible when we catch a Pokemon we're doing a classic speedrun. There's a, a category of uh, Pokemon speedrunning community called classic, where we don't allow the RNG manipulation that's possible by playing the game perfectly, like we showed in the, in the past. It's actually possible for humans to play that perfectly in Pokemon for a few seconds, the game starts up, and then get an encounter right away in the game and get an exact Pokemon they want because there's these things called buffer windows where they can hold an input through the buffer and it will always happen on the same frame and then they go into the game and you get the same Pokemon every time. So in the classic category, that's bad. It's like, oh, it's too powerful. You can't do that. That gets your Pokemon perfect. It's not fun. If you're playing with the same Pokemon every time, it's like, okay, I don't have to think at all. I can destroy this thing and probably do the same amount of damage. It doesn't do quite quite the same amount of damage, but it always has more damage than your rank. So, some people are like, I want to run the classic category, and then they need to be able to calculate their DVs on the fly based on what they see. So, uh, I think I've talked about all this stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, so the next key thing here is the actual site. So, when you catch your Nidoran to win a round of Pokemon Yellow, because Nidoran is the most powerful Pokemon in the beginning of Pokemon Yellow, it'll have some of these stats for its HP, attack, defense, speed, special. So you click on like, oh, it has like 12 attack, nine defense, 12 speed, and nine special. And then the site has a bunch of math to figure out which of those are actually like possible uh, DV combinations. Because for example, if you had 23 HP, we immediately know you had, you had the high bit of every one of the other numbers. Because you must have had like, if the attack of the last bit is one, and that's going to add 8 to the attack DV, or the HP DV. And then if you go to this uh, defense, it's going to add 4. So we know it, it must be at least attack has the last bit is 1, defense has the last bit is 1. So the, the site does a bunch of map and background for all these bits, and then figures out, oh, these are your DVs. Like immediately, without hardly having to do anything beyond just knowing the, uh, the stats that you see in, in your screen. So that's super, super useful. And one of the things I want to talk about when I built this site was Pug Markup. I love Pug. I wish it was used more in the static websites. It's this HTML templating language where you don't have to write like end tags. You just write like dot container and it translates that to a class or h1 space and then it treats that as your h1 thing. I, I love what Terst is. I wish there was more ways of doing that on the web. Uh, so I love using Pug in that and also you can see some of the, the internal math in plain JavaScript. Uh, in plain JavaScript, to remove those bits, you can see we wrote, like, remove a number that has this bit, and then there's an array of bytes, and it removes bytes that have certain bits. So, uh, now, okay, this is what I really love talking about for uh, conferences like this, so rgbscaler.com. So if, if, you, if you feel like you've been overloaded with information, you might want to leave now, because we're going we're gonna to get into a whole other layer of complexity here. So, the first thing we're going to talk about with a bunch of problems we have with archiving video for task videos is called chroma subsampling. So we got to go back to the days when they had a black and white TV. When they went when they had black and white TV, they were like, we want color TV now. And when they added color TV, they wanted backwards compatibility. So instead of having red, green, and blue, like our eyes detect, they decided, why don't we translate that to a brightness component, which would still be used for the black and white TVs, and then a difference between the brightness and blue, and a difference between the brightness and green, and you can use those three numbers to reverse engineer red, green, and blue for newer color TVs, but then the older ones could use the brightness signal alone and ignore the other two channels. And then somebody else came along after that, after color TV, was like, oh my goodness, I know that humans are more uh, susceptible to differences in brightness 
and they aren't colored. So if we reduce the frequency of the colored data, we can transmit more data along the, the cable lines for like high resolution data for the brightness and that gives better quality. The problem is they weren't thinking forward about how signals have gone out. So now even today, almost any video you watch online will be encoded in that way of brightness and the difference components and not actually red, green, and blue. So this is a huge problem for uh, preserving and restoring game footage because game footage is going straight from a game console to a TV. It doesn't care about needing to save data over all these cable lines all over the country. So it goes straight red, green, and blue right from your TV. So if, if, for example, you needed to archive footage of an NES in 240p, that 240 by pixels is going to be, well, every pixel is going to be a red, green, and blue component. But if you were to save it the way that a video normally is saved on like YouTube in 240p, you would have the right brightness information for every one of the pixels. But for every like quadrant of four pixels, it would have that to only having like one uh, shared color value for that set of four pixels. And we'll see in the next couple slides what that looks like in practice. The second problem is stretched aspect ratio. So games back in that day did not actually output a specific number of pixels. It was more like we have 240 lines of pixels and we're gonna paint them for a certain amount of time across the screen. So there was no concept of uh, a certain specific resolution that your games run at. It's not running at 240 by 320, it's not running at 240 by 280, it's running at 240 and then just however long your display is for the CRT. So the games actually ended up having rectangular pixels because they would paint a little bit longer than they would be tall. And obviously displays do not have rectangular pixels. Each pixel is just a tiny red, green, and blue dot. Or it gets way more complicated. We don't need to get actually into how the newer ones work because sometimes they have white dots. Sometimes they have these like quantum filters. But the, the older displays, they didn't have pixels. They were just shooting a phosphor beam at a, a capital gray tube, and it would paint a little bit longer than it was tall with the beam for each pixel. So we can't really replicate that very effectively on modern screens because they have square pixels, so you get another, another kind of artifact of these uh, pixels of not aligning. Then we also have to talk about upscaling for display presentation because 240p is probably like this big on the screen, and you gotta get it this big to be able to see it. So if you're upscaling it, uh, we have to use an algorithm for upscaling. There's a really common one used called bilinear, almost everyone's web, and it's used that way because it's really uh, power efficient. Like if you're using like a phone, uh, watching a video that's like 240p upscaling on your phone with bilinear, you're not going to hardly lose any power. But it looks terrible for video game footage. Really, really terrible. So we try to use different kinds of upscaling algorithms for preserving our video game footage. Like uh, sharp by linear or sometimes called area or nearest neighbor where it looks blocky stuff that pulls up. And then there's two more things. Loss decompression. Loss decompression is when you have a video and it looks degraded. You might see like speckles or other artifacts in the video that are uh, you can kind of see it like uh, you know like the, the do I know what a JPEG is meme? It's also sometimes called deep fried memes where they like like really uh, just artifact it. Uh, that's velocity compression, and it, it happens often in like photos like JPEGs too. Lossless footage, where you don't have that problem, is not widely supported on the internet. But there are two newer codecs, H.265 and AV1, which respectively can be used on iPhones and Android phones, which support lossless footage, so we can do that with RGB scaling. And the last problem, okay, okay, so we have all these problems. Some of the, the artists for old video game consoles were really smart, they're like, hey, if I know about these things, that I can make art based on what I know is going to be degraded in the signal, and then it'll look the way I want afterward. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, if you're trying to preserve a game accurately, you need to not just uh, actually like get rid of all these problems, but actually cause some of them again to look the, make the art look correct. Uh, a, a common uh, thing that, it's, uh, that shows us is called dithering. 
So imagine you have like a 256 bit color display. It has that many colors? You want more colors? So he's like, okay, I know the colors are going to blur together around that nearby pixels. So if you want like a color between uh, color 255 and color 254, you say, okay, I'm going to put 254 here and a 255 here and checkerboard it. So you see this thing that looks kind of like a checkerboard in a lot of old games. That's dithering. Because if you played it on old CRTs, it wouldn't look like a checkerboard, it would look like a kind of smooth blend of color. So, the thing on the left is uh, one of the first Zelda games, and Z uh, Link has his shield, and it's a little bit bigger than on the bottom one, and that's because we're using point scaling. So point scaling says for every pixel in the source, we're going to try to use that same color somewhere in the alpha image. So we're not going to have any blending like in bilinear. Bilinear says, well, I'm going to create a smooth gradient between the colors that are possible in the source image. And then over here on area, it says, OK, if I have a source image, I'm going to use the exact color if I can. But if I have a pixel that doesn't quite line up right, where like, maybe it's, it needs to be like a four and a half pixel, I'm going to blend on that. So you see, in, in this area one, Link's shield is the same size at the top and the bottom. But in the nearest neighbor one, his shield is bigger on one frame than the next frame when he's moved through. Because it, it needs to map to an exact number of pixels. So we, we definitely like this area effect because it's as good as it could possibly get for your screen. And then it also preserves shapes. I, I kind of liken it to the Mercator projection in maps, where like you have these like, really stretched continents that, that, that it's preserving the longitude and latitude lines but the cotton look, look all long. That's what's happening with the point scale. Okay. So what we did was we used a WebGL2 canvas to implement custom scaling algorithms that do all the stuff correct for uh, older retro video in the canvas. And, and so it's terribly power inefficient. You never actually want to do this, and it's very experimental. But it makes it look correct. So uh, you can kind of see here, uh, this is what happens to Atari Dragster footage if you have all of these problems happen at the same time. You can kind of see, there's just like a lot of blur. You can see there's kind of like these artifacts happening. There's like white bits next to the five and seven that shouldn't be there. And if you get everything correct, it looks more, look more like this. I'll just flip back and forth a couple times. And this is what we would try to aim for when we're doing web uh, preservation in this video. And then there's another layer I talked about. So some games like intentionally try to work with the way that the uh, screen would damage the data. So we also have CRT simulation, where this is layering over the phosphor mask that would happen on an actual CRT to kind of blend the coverage together. So if you go to this QR code on your phone, you might be able, may, and then this is very experimental, you may be able to see on your actual phone some of the same technology for a uh, specific speed run that we've archived. And I'll play it up on the screen here too, so we can all see it. This, you guys hopefully are seeing the same thing on your phones that work, or it might not work. It's very experimental. But the, uh, the basic idea is this site is scaling this footage of Teenage Mutant Turtles exactly for what this display could possibly show you. So this is probably the sharpest footage of NES you've ever seen. Uh, it's impossible to get any sharper. So, yeah. And we're trying to go back slowly and do some uh, upscaling for more videos than just this one. I did like a bowling task too, but um, this is so experimental and so niche. We are still kind of thinking through exactly how we would want to go back and do this for, if we went back for a whole archive of every game we've done for passing, and it was kind of, so it's, it's not been uh, done for everything yet, but we have a proof of concept that you could actually do this preserve record footage if you want to preserve it. Cool, any, any questions from the wall over here on this one? I missed the part, I don't know if you said it, where um, the source of the archive is, is just a file that's uploaded in a specific format, is it all a specific format? Yeah, that's being an extremely specific format. So uh, it, it can be AV1 or H265, those both work losslessly on the web. You can also use H264 lossless. Um, those, all of the files I'm talking about have .mp4 extensions, 
except for AP1 has like a, I think it's a WebM container format, but uh, H.264, the only browser that supports it properly for lossless on the internet is Chrome on the desktop. And the reasoning behind that all is that your, your phones, they only have decoders for a very, very small subset of the, all, all the possible videos that you can make. Uh, so that they can be, I would talk about like power efficiency, that's the main idea. It's like, if they do, if there's a really small subset of H.264 videos, they can be really power efficient with that subset and then It'll look, it'll look worse, but then nobody will care or notice because the phones are really high resolution. They use AI to upscale some downloads. So, but, they, they, but they're not targeting those technologies for video, they're targeting them for film footage. So. All right, so one final thing. A little, little, little last treat for the show today. We have been building a new website for emulating the Game Boy in the browser. It's called T3 Boy, after the T3 step. If you watch Theo, he does his T3 stuff. And T3 Boy is a copy of the exact same emulator we use to make all of these console accurate speedruns, but it runs in the browser. And we, use that, and we do that by using Inscripted. So Inscripted can take C code and emit a WebAssembly binary that has that same C code. And then we can hook into the C code in our website in React with use effect clips and stuff and drive the emulator in a website. So I have already picked out Pokemon Yellow and a uh, BIOS for apps. This is very important for legal reasons. This site does not host any proprietary Nintendo technology. You have to have your own copy of the game and the BIOS, which are very proprietary to Nintendo. And uh, you can also upload an input log like I was showing for the piano roll um, the game view. And once you have those things uploaded, uh, let's, let's refresh them. Sometimes the game doesn't work uh, quite right if you don't refresh the page first. I'm just going to double check here, refresh it, uh, pick my input log, and then go down here and play. Uh, well, the, I have to manually click play because there's this uh, stuff now where browsers don't want like Fox News or CNN to autoplay audio for you when you go to the website. So this relies very closely on the audio system of, of the site to work. So you have to manually click the play button for the emulator to start. And the buttons are touch input compatible. So if you go, if you like go on your phone to t3boy.personal.app and you had all these files, you could play on your phone with the buttons. And this is doing exactly what we're just doing on the game view. It's verifying in this that this emulator is as accurate as the actual GameCube and Game Boy Player combinations. Which I'm super excited about because it's an entirely new like era and level of accuracy in website uh, emulators. So, uh, if you guys are cool, I can show a little bit of code behind that that I was talking about with the use effect. So the T3 Boy is the repo where this is hosted. And if you go into the source uh, pages and in index, you can see this is all written in like your standard Next.js website. But when you go down into your things like use effects, we are wrapping C code from Inscripted to pull out functions like how do I check the revision of the library or whatever. Or uh, this one creates the actual instance of the emulator. Or, Load buff and load buff. These are the functions that let us inject the ROM, inject the BIOS into the emulator. And once we have all those functions pulled out in the state books, we can then go down further and uh, run the actual functions and, and call them into C in our render loop. So, like down here in the render loop, we uh, get audio back for our context, put it into the two channels of the audio buffer, and then uh, at the bottom here, it's a request animation frame loop. So this is key. This, I use the same thing, the same technology and concepts of a request animation frame loop, loop in RGB scaler and on T3 Boy, so that it's only rendering a frame as often as your device wants a new frame. It's not saying like every thousandth of a second, hey, check we need a new frame yet. It's only doing that if your display is potentially new frame. So, uh, yeah. That's uh, T3 Boy, and if you want, I have 
these cool Discord invite links, and you can come chat about the work in Discord. Thanks so much.